got this one. Thanks, thanks. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Hey. If you're visiting with us this morning, hope you feel right at home and super chill. Um, if you are visiting, we've been preaching the last little while through a series. Well, even if you aren't visiting, we've still been preaching through a series. <laughs> we've been preaching through a series through the battles of the Old Testament. And we've looked at some obscure ones. We've, uh, looked at, and then we've looked at some sort of more well-known ones, the Battle of Jericho and Crossing the Red Sea. Then last week, we looked at the Battle of I, A-I, E, I, O. Old MacDonald had a farm. I don't know how to quite pronounce the word, but it was... Really quite an, an interesting look at a whole, um, why does God put these stories in the Bible? And so today, we are preaching a, another battle, but a little bit more of a well-known battle. Uh, this is the battle of David and Goliath. Uh, you may have heard of it. Um, it's even in our vernacular. We talk about David slaying Goliath. It's like a, there's a whole bunch of stories that come out of this, or stuff that's in our everyday culture. We talk about David against Goliath stories. We also talk about in the church, sometimes don't wear Saul's armor. It's another one of those kind of things that's kind of bandied around. But today, hopefully, uh, we're going to have a bit of a fresh look at this. And this is always the pressure, right, as a preacher. It's like, I've said this before, it's like Christmas and Easter. You don't want to preach the same sermon every year because God's word is always new. So when I knew I was doing David and Goliath, like, hey, he's cheated because he's preaching next week and he preached some obscure battle I didn't even know was in the Bible. <laughs> like, pick some things so you can say anything. And I'm like, wow, that's so interesting. Anyway, so I'm doing David and Goliath this morning and hopefully finding something in here that's meaty, that's going to challenge us and get all up in our grill and challenge us. So please turn with me in your Bible to 1, Ch- 1 Samuel chapter, <laughs> or let's do 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soka in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes Damon between Soka and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. A champion named Goliath who was from Gath came out from the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and he wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his his legs he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come up and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me, and if he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistine's words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Now, I don't know what your mental picture is of the story, but I want to kind of paint it a little bit and help clarify one or two things, because I think... There's some stuff that we hear in general um, Christianese and general Christian stories that isn't quite true, and it kind of detracts a little bit from the story. So you might have heard like when Saul, back in the New Testament, when Saul was traveling to Damascus and Jesus meets him and strikes him blind, a lot of people say that God, Jesus knocked him off his donkey and struck him blind. There's no donkey in the story, right? So there's one or two things that we get, like we start adding stuff to the story, we start making it a little bit weird. So what I'd like to do is paint the story so that we understand exactly what's going on, because it's even more bizarre when you understand what was going on. So let's paint it. So what happened was, every morning, the Philistines would march out of their camp, and they would line up. And then the Israelites would march out of their camp every morning. This happened for 40 days. They would march out for 40 days, and they would also stand in a line, but they were chanting a war cry the whole time, the Israelites. I don't know if they were like remembering Jericho, if they had the trumpet guys, or what happened. But for 40 days, the the Philistines would line up in the morning. It's not like the Israelites were sitting in their tents, hiding under their beds, waiting, because that's how we picture the story, right? They were hiding away, and Goliath walks down on his own. It didn't happen like that. The armies faced each other in a line. And when they were facing each other, and the Israelites had been all vinchat, walking down there, and a little bit like, you know, like chanting chanting our chants and doing our thing. And then they get there, they're standing in line. And while they're standing in two lines, Goliath steps out. And he says, I can't for your problem, Mark. 
daar gaan groot twak vandag hier so wees. So he says that, and it says at that point, all the Israelites fled for 40 days. Can you imagine that? How ridiculous that is. Like every day. I wonder what it was like. And I kind of started asking myself the question, what were they hoping was going to happen? Were they hoping that if each day they kept coming down, eventually Goliath would have a heart attack? That a, a random crow would fly past and take his eye out out of vicious anger? I don't know. Like I'm trying to work out what they thought. For 40 days, they, they marched out, stood on the line. They knew what was going to happen, but they're just like, yeah, we are. Standing in this line, hoping it would go away. Or maybe they were hoping someone else would deal with Goliath. See, the thing is, they didn't want to look like a chop. Because not only, they didn't want to be the guy that stepped out and he was the reason why Israel lost the battle, right? So no one wants to step out and be that guy. But also, they didn't want to be embarrassed in the way they would be exposed as they fought and looked like an idiot when Goliath took them apart in front of everybody. And so there was like safety in numbers. And so they were thinking it's too much. They could lose face. They were terrified of the consequences. But all the while, their authority and their conviction was slowly being undermined. Think about it. Day one, they're standing there in the line. We're going to fight the Israel. They're going to fight the Philistines. They've heard rumors about this big guy, but you know what I mean. There's Abraham over here, and he's a ninja. He used special forces, and he can sort anyone out. We saw him against the Malachites in Jericho. He double flipped over the wall, stabbed four guys in the head with a bottle. He's amazing, right? So we're going to trust that Abraham is the guy. They're all standing there day one, and this guy, who's seven and a half foot tall, walks out and starts shouting at them. His spearhead, that weight, it's seven kgs. That's how much that number of shekels is. Just the spearhead weighed seven kgs. And a weaver's rod is like this thick. That's how thick this, and this guy walks out. And all of a sudden, people are going like, <whistles> but that night, I'm just adding some, th some stuff to the story. That night when they're sitting around the fire, Bobby <laughs> has a bit too much to drink. And Bobby's like, no, no worries, tomorrow. Look, I'm there. And everyone's like, Bobby, you've got this. Like, I've got this. And they're all like cheering for Bobby. And Bobby's like, whoa, we're going to smash this guy. Next morning, Bobby's hung over and he's not even in the line. He's still in his tent. And the second morning, hey, there's a rumor in the ben one of the Benjamites, he was like a really good fighter. Maybe he'll do it. But there's this rumor about this guy doesn't exist. And then day three, doesn't Elijah have a cousin who hasn't come yet? Like he's maybe still back. Like Elijah should get on the phone and phone his cousin and tell him, you know, like you, if you were ever at school, like, I'll phone my friends and they'll come club your friends and stuff. Like Elijah's got a friend on the speed dial, but no one's coming. And day after day, they just get undermined and their hearts become weaker and they become like water in their hearts because they're like, who's going to take this guy out? Day 40, eventually just clutching at straws. And so the Israelites find themselves in a place where they're just waiting for some indeterminate outcome to happen. And friends, here's the thing. The consequences of that are infinitely worse than facing the thing that's right in front of you. And I, I've looked at our lives sometimes. It can be in our businesses, it can be in our relationships, it can be in our thought life. There's something that's shouting at us. There's something that's all up in our grill. There's something that's all over us. And fear grips us. We st <laughs> but we still walk out there hoping it'll just go away. It's like we pretend. It's not there. But it's right there. And it steps out. And we know what's going to happen. It lines up against us. It could be a sin issue, something in our lives. They line, they line up against us and we know what's coming, but we just stand there. And when it steps out, we flee and we run back to our tents. But day after day, we're in, in that position. Relationships, business, our thought life. We sing that song, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm a child of God. But all of us have got these things that when they do step out the line, we don't want to make any decisions in that moment. We just want to run and hide. And the Israelites find themselves in that position day after day after day. 
And the saddest thing is, if you look at how, if you look at Goliath's, how he saw the battle, the Israelites bought into the same thinking. Because he says this to them, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? No, we're not the servants of Saul. We're the children of God. But Goliath doesn't see it like that. And the children of Israel buy into the same lie. And so now it's on them to go and sort it out. It's on Saul. Saul was bigger than everybody else. When you read about Saul, when he was ordained, he was told, why didn't Saul do it? Saul had, a, I'm sure he had a million excuses. Oh, guys, Edmund being the king, you know, got so much paperwork to get through. He had a reason. And so they reduced their thinking from the God who had shouted down and torn down the walls of Jericho and opened the sea and done all these things, that God, they're not the children of that God anymore. Now they're just the servants of Saul, there to do a job. And so they bought into the reduction. They bought into the, the lie that it had nothing to do with God. This is between you and me. And friends, can I suggest to us today that whatever your station is in life, you're not just a mom, you're not just a dad, you're not just a business owner or a CEO or an employee or whatever label you've put on yourself. You are that of God. And it makes such a difference in the way we approach our lives. Not just a mom, not the mom of God. <laughs> that was Mary. But you, what I'm trying to, you, know, you know what I'm trying to say? I'm a mom sent on behalf of God. It changes the vernacular altogether. It changes the whole scenario. But we, unfortunately, we live in a world and we buy into the reduction because it's so real in front of us. The enemy shouts, and I'm like, I'm just a person. And we begin to create this weird, sacred, secular divide in our life between there's my Christian walk and then there's the rest of my life. I love what Haig says. It's like our joke, right? This is oranges at half time. But it's true. Because this isn't the game. The game is Monday through Saturday doing what God has called us to do. That's the real, that's the Christian walk. That's the church. This is a moment. That's all it is. I think Sunday gets way too much profile in the Christian church, friends. Honestly, it's great to be together. But this is such a... It's like a fart in eternity. Honestly, we've got... Like, think about it. We've got an hour together on a Sunday, and then we've got all week. How many hours? On behalf of Jesus. Sent by Him. Called by Him. Equipped by Him. A mom on behalf of God. A dad on behalf of God. An employee on behalf of God. Called to your business on behalf of God. Called into the relationship with your spouse on behalf of God. Whatever that place is, please, friends, we can't allow ourselves to buy into that reductionism. I am a child of God. I am no longer a slave to fear. Anyway, then the story continues. Now Jesse said to his son David, this is from verse 17, Take this ephah of roast grain and these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Now, obviously, the commander of his, his, their unit was Italian because in verse 18, it says, take along these 10 cheeses to the commander of their unit. So we're going to, I know we call him Luigi, right? So take the 10 cheeses to Luigi and see how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men in Israel in the Valley of Ella. Listen to what the dad thinks they're doing. Fighting against the, the Philistines. They're not fighting against the Philistines. Just a point of interest. They're running away from the Philistines every day. They spend more time under their beds, right, than out in the sunlight. Terrified that if one guy, you know, if you, if you walk outside your tent looking a little bit buff, you might be the guy that's delegated to go sort out Goliath. Commander walks through the camp. Everyone's busy. What are you doing? I'm praying. Just praying. A moment. Um... What are you doing? I just want to make sure my tents, you know, like pegs are in the ground, under the ground by this stage. There's nothing left. No one wants to be the guy. Israel thought they were fighting the Philistines and not hiding away. I don't know why I thought about that. I don't know why that struck me, but I guess it's because, maybe it's just a thought, but I feel like in, especially in leadership in the church, we should be doing what we're saying. 
and we shouldn't be pretending. I guess it's just such a weird thought. I know it's a little bit of an aside, but too often in church, there's a perception of what leadership in the church is doing, and then there's what leadership in the church is actually doing. The two should be the same thing, right? We should be honest. <coughs> Early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd. He loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. So here they are again. <laughs> like, I don't know what's going to happen. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines, facing each other. Israel and the Philistines. David left his things with the keeper of supplies and ran to the battle lines and asked his brother how, brothers how they were. As he was talking with him, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. So I, maybe my brain's a little bit broken, but like, I, I think about what it must have been like to be David. Like his dad, like he gets stuck at home. He's looking after the sheep. He hears that the, the Israelites are fighting this big war against the Philistines. Like, whoa. You know? Because he's a kid. He doesn't understand the brutality of war. But anyway, he's excited. So he can't wait to see. Because he knows his brother Eliab is like this. He's frisk, right? When, you, when Samuel went to go and look at all the brothers, when he ordained David eventually as king, he says all these brothers were like these good-looking, ripped like steroid junkies, all of these guys, they were like ready to cha change the world. They were big guys. So he's like, can't wait to get and ask Eliab, like, how many guys do you have? And then Eliab would like pull out scalps, you know, like, I know it's gross, but you know what I mean? Like, just, these are my trophies. Yeah, I killed this many guys. He's so excited. He's this kid. And then he gets there and his timing's perfect. The Israelites are marching into battle and David's like, oh, this is going to be epic. Not so much. Because while he's standing there, the guys line up and the other guys line up. He's like just waiting for that moment. And then this big guy steps out. It's like, ah! And everyone runs away. <laughs> I wonder how David felt. He must have been bummed. This is not what I heard was going on in the battle. So it's helpful to stick ourselves in the story a little bit, right? He reached the camp as the army was going to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. He probably joined in, you know. Wah! We are the children of God, and we're going to kill you. Ah! And then we run away. Israel and the Philistines were drawing their lines up. What on earth is going on? And friends, this is the thing. Just to put it in our world, I don't reckon every single one of those guys wanted to run. But when everybody's doing something, that pressure, right, is inevitable. You don't want to be the guy left on your own there. And so everybody did run. It would have just taken one guy or two guys to peel away and go, mm. and it's just like, you know, like when you watch like a house or a building that's been, it just like slowly crumbles like that. They don't blow up the whole building when they do that. When they, what do you, demolinate. Demolish and detonate. Yes. When you do that, they just put it around a few of the key pillars and boom, the whole thing falls down. That's all that would have happened. I wonder what that was like for David walking into that situation. Because it makes it all the more amazing when you see David's response. He just watched everyone, including all of his heroes, all the guys whose posters he had on the wall at home. All of those guys ran away. So one of the things I like to do when I'm studying through a piece of scripture is to play Where's Wally. You ever play Where's Wally? In America, it's Where's Waldo. You know, where's Wally? You know little, the guy with the red cap? You know, that irritating. <laughs> one of the keys to understanding scripture is to find Jesus on every page and in every story. It's so helpful. Like, what does this teach us about Jesus? So you get the Where's Wally thing, right? So we're looking for Jesus in the story. Where is he and what does this teach us about who he is? Because the story of Jesus is on every page of the Bible. There's this incredible golden thread that runs through the whole Old Testament. The Old is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. They're like this beautiful meshing that comes together. But Jesus is always there. Before the foundations of the world, Scripture teaches that there was a slain lamb. God's plan was always redemption. And it's so beautiful. So where's Jesus in this story? Well, 
Friends, Jesus saw us when we were helpless. Higgs mentioned some of the stuff that he's seen in his life. All of us have faced different things. And all of us were standing there at some stage in our life, and the giant would come out, and we would run. Or we would just fall on the floor or do whatever. And Jesus knew that we couldn't rescue ourselves. And when Jesus walked this earth, Hebrews teaches that he was tested in every way just as we were, yet he was without sin. And so he watched us all run away. And when mankind ran away and couldn't redeem themselves, Jesus stepped into the gap and fought the battle on our behalf. And friends, it's so important to understand that because why do we think that Jesus would fight the battle once and then for the rest of our life go, it's up to you now, you go and win it. But friends, he is saving us, he is redeeming us, he is sanctifying us every single day. He is fighting the battle for us each day. Scripture teaches that he makes intercession for us. He prays for us constantly. Speaks to his father about us. For you and for me. And so many of us, when that giant steps out, we go by into that reduction thing and it's just me and him. Unaware of the fact that Jesus wants to step in and fight on our behalf. It takes, we'll talk about it in a moment, it takes surrender and it takes obedience for sure. But Jesus wants to fight on our behalf. But we're so quick. Maybe your children are going sideways at the moment and you don't know what to do about it. And you're looking at it and you're like, I should have been a better parent. I should have done more. Right now, Jesus is waiting to step into the gap. Maybe it's a business thing that you're facing. Maybe it's a financial thing. I don't know. Maybe it's in your mental health, your space in your head. And it's just, it's a hard space. Jesus stepping into the gap on our behalf. He always, always steps into rescue. Our sins had us pinned and we were unable to fight back. Our addictions, our fears, our failures, our weaknesses all shouted at us and made us flee. Felt like that before? And Jesus took our place like David in a fight that wasn't his to fight. The great shepherd, Romans 5.8, but God proves his love for us in this, like Ren was singing, right? Our God is love. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Like, I don't know what we think. Like, what, did I do enough good stuff that I could get God's attention and then he suddenly saved me? Or did he come sovereignly by his grace and save me because he loves me? That's a position that we live in, friends. We never graduate beyond that. I've said this before, but I don't know where we get this thinking where I think all of a sudden I go from that to somehow now, like, the, you know, from a junior partner in heaven, now I'm sort of like one of the senior partners in heaven, and you know, now there's a whole behavioral thing that I've got to get right to keep earning it. But I'm always a recipient of Jesus' grace, and it does transform me, and I do change. But I don't change to try and earn. I change as a result of his work in me. And I see him fight battles, so I go fight battles on, the, on behalf of others. And care for them. We have a responsibility to tell people of this incredible Savior who has overcome. And then this other quick thought popped in when I was reading it. Just thought to flip it around a little bit. It's funny how us as Christians, you know when God sends us to a place? Like we came here to Joburg to plant a church. All of us get sent to different places. I don't know why we have this thinking that it's going to be hunky-dory when we arrive there. Like when we arrive and everyone's going to be waiting, you know, like... Are you the man of God that I dreamed about this morning? Hallelujah. As we walk into checkers. <laughs> Minister unto me, for I am heavy laden and in need of much prayer. Like if that's happened to you, like you flippin' rock star. Like, <laughs> not so much. I remember Ash telling me a story about, where was it, dude? Where you prayed for that guy and he told you to F off. <laughs> he like really felt to pray for this guy so he can I pray for you and the guy said no <laughs> friends things aren't always hunky dory where God sends us right I mean, David walked and everyone was running in the opposite direction but there's a moment where we step in and it's like despite that here I am sent by God 
Jesus is always the answer. Then, text number three, 1 Samuel 17 from verse 28. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, what did he do? He's brought this cheese and he's brought the bread and whatever. Eliab burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is and you came down only to watch the battle. Like, what? David's like, I, I'm not giving you any bread. <laughs> you know, like, I'm taking the bread home with me. And Luigi's only getting five cheeses to so make you march more, whatever the thing is. And this is the crazy thing. If you look at what Eliab is accusing David of, it's exactly what he's doing himself. He's also just watching the battle. Even though he's dressed in armor, even though he's got his shotgun, you know, and you know, his Kevlar and stuff, and he's ready to roll, he's also just watching. He's not doing anything. And can I just mention for a second, friends, when God does call us into a space and send us somewhere, you're going to pick up some flack. We're going to pick up some flack from people. But it's not because of us. It's because of the battles that they are privately facing that they're afraid of. It's not about you. We can't afford to have a church that's got eggshell skulls, super sensitive little princesses who are like, oh, he said that, but it's so horrible. He was my brother. How could he do that? But to understand from where that criticism and that hurt comes from and be like, okay, I understand. But grace for it. David doesn't flip. It doesn't take him off his path. He fought Goliath for Jesus and for Eliab. Called by Jesus, but also to save Eliab. And he didn't allow it to get in his heart. And friends, a church that's all about me and what I want and what I think is a useless church. It can't do anything. Those who have come to watch the battle and merely to spectate the move of God are useless in the kingdom. We aren't called to spectate and just to watch. Do I, enjoy being, do I enjoy being around the people of God? Watching, listening, receiving second-hand blessings. It's all good, but the moment the giant steps on the ranks, we will melt away just like all the others. And then what happens is we become critical and angry of those who do want to step up, sometimes even opposing those that God has raised up. That's being Eliab. What about being David in this story? Jesus has called us, much like David, to sometimes march into battle on behalf of others. And the reception isn't always welcoming, especially from those closest to us. If you look at the, do you, see some the, do you see what Eliab said to him? He didn't say to him, you young, you're a chop, you're a, you know, what do you, like, listen to the things he said. You are, I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. This is his brother who grew up with him. He says, go at his call and at his character. I have to know who we are, friend. We have to settle that stuff. Psalm 51.10 Created in me, David wrote this, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And the reason this is so important, friends, if we do go into a scenario, whatever the scenario is, and we haven't allowed God to, to work in us and to transform us, what if David did have a conceited and wicked heart? And Eliab goes, <coughs> David falls off the line. But if my identity is in who Jesus is, and I've allowed him to work in me, those fiery darts can come, but they don't find purchase because my identity is not in you like me, or you like me, or I want you to like me, or I want you to accept me. My identity is in Jesus has said this, he's at work in me, and I'm here on your behalf to love. It's tricky. It is so necessary to ensure that the accusations cannot take root in our hearts because we're walking with Jesus. If you notice that when we're walking closely with Jesus, people can say stuff and it bounces off, but we drift, and all of a sudden those fiery darts take purchase. So it's always walk closely, walk closely, 
not get it right, walk closely. In text 3, verse 38, Spoiler alert, David kills Goliath. We don't quite get there with the story, but he does, and it's amazing. 1 Samuel 17, verse 38. Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I can't go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took the staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with a sling in hand, he approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with a shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was a little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said. I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of Saul. No. I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have, defi- whom you have defied. And friends, this whole piece here is about keeping up appearances. It's very interesting because when we read this story, probably we're taught this. You know the thing about Saul's armor? David never wore Saul's armor, if you read this text. It was his tunic. It says a bronze helmet and a suit of armor. It wasn't Saul's armor that he put on, but it was Saul's tunic. Now, a tunic, the reason that's important is a tunic was one of those, you know, like old school, it looked like a dress that they used to wear with a belt around it. I was going to put a picture of like, you know, if you typically think biblical times, sandals, the little weird dressing the guys used to wear with the little belts around them, running, Greek vibes, whatever. Okay. So I got a picture of my head, <laughs> sorry. But you get it. That's the tunic. And the reason it was so important that David would wear the tunic was so that he could look the part because Saul's tunic was incredibly richly embroidered and looked beautiful and made him stand out from amongst everybody else. There's only so much you can do to armor. Right? This is still very early, early on. Like this is just some of the Bronze Age if you look at the helmets they're wearing. And so the tunic would have been beautiful. So put this on so that you look the part. So when you go out there, they think, this is the guy. That's what Saul was worried about. There was nothing Saul was giving him to make him more fit or make him more ready for battle. Saul was just like, let's put a label on him, make him look awesome. And David tries, but he's not an armor guy. He's got his own tunic. Saul's tunic, Saul's much taller than him. It doesn't fit him. David had his own sword. It says he put his sword on. And Saul was more worried about David's appearances when he walked out into that battle. Look the part before you go. And what's so interesting is Goliath also thinks that David looks wholly unprepared when David walks out. He's also worried about it. Look what he says to David. He looks at him, sees him, and despises him. Also all about appearances. You have to look the part. If you're going to go fight the fight, you've got to look the part. You have to have the preparation all sorted. You have to know all the stuff. You have to be ready. And it's the lie we buy into. David walked out there. And God knew the preparation he'd put into David. So David was ready to walk out. So interesting. I, I found some pictures on, online. I was going to pop them up, but then I forgot. Um, the, in that area, right, they, they had flint. And so the, there was a whole collection actually found at the Tell, which is like a mound that is kind of develops over time, over settlements. So you, you excavate a Tell and you find the different civilizations inside it. And they would take these flint, like balls of flint. Now you know flint, if you break it, you can make these little sharp things and whatever, history, you know, school, whatever. But these flint balls were incredibly heavy and super smooth and super round. It's not like one of those, you know, not like, not like skim stones that you find, these things, and they're shiny. And, David, and they were usually about the size of a golf ball. And they're very precious if you found them, because they were quite hard to work if you found them. So David goes and he finds these things. He find, the fact that he found five of them is pretty amazing, and just like that. But he finds these perfect-sized little golf balls ready to rock and roll. So I want to finish today by speaking about David's armor and his weapons, because everybody's looking at him going, David's got no armor. And David's got no weapons. David said to the Philistine, I, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, 
That's what you got in your hand. Let me tell you what I've got in my hand. I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defined, defied. I come against you in the name of the Lord. Solomon wrote this, and I wonder if he heard it from his dad in Proverbs 18.10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. So Goliath standing there looking like this human behemoth with all his weapons. But David's marching out. Strong tower all around him. It's like a castle marching out against a person. That's David's conviction on it. Like, what's the best this guy can do? Bang his sword on the wall? Knock at the gate? What's the password? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Like, <laughs> he, like, he's got no chance. Because he's coming out in the name of the Lord. And again, friends, I think of reductionism where we like, I'm thinking like, it's just little me. Now, if you guard with your sword and you want to go sword to sword, for sure. But this is a, a strong tower marching out against a person. And that's exactly what happened. One of the stones fell off the tower, hit the giant, and he was dead. And then it went over his head and ripped it off. It was amazing. The God who protected David from the lion and the bear, the God who parted the Red Sea, the God who tore down the walls of Jericho, was his strength, his weapon, and his defense. So he overcame. We make such a big thing of it. Like this little guy, David and Goliath. It's the other way around, friends. Like Goliath didn't stand a snowball's chance in hell of making it through that fight. He was getting mowed down no matter what. Friends, it's not possible to be submitted to the name of the Lord and still try to keep up appearances. Submitted to the Lord. The name of the Lord. What has God said? Obedience and submission to his word. Part of church community. Hearts open, vulnerable. Open to correction from friends and from people that we trust. We live in that space under God's word. Putting what he says into practice, even if it seems old-fashioned sometimes and doesn't seem to fit with the vibe. Because it makes us look like we don't fit. The pressure on us nowadays, friends, to put on the tunic that looks, good, that looks good. Social media, in our workplaces, in our relationships, our speech, everything. Put on the tunic, look like a... And there's times when it doesn't matter, but we can't be fighting for the tunic. I want to wear it. What does God put in our hand? The name of the Lord. Our God is love. How do we fight with that love? I love the heart of David in this, that he was sent. I want to finish with a story, um, and then we're done. I want to, practically, what does this look like? So, Higgs mentioned Lionel and Sazi, who lead the church in Francistown. Sydney and I got to know them a few years ago. At, we've been working into Botswana for a while, mainly into Gabs, haven't really been up to Francistown, but we've got a great relationship with Lionel and Sazi. Love them lots, amazing couple. They took over the church in the middle of COVID. The guy who was leading the church was like, eh, eh. and so hospital pass, they had to pick up a church in the middle of COVID when you can't meet. And they've done a great job. They've been amazing. They've loved that church and laid their lives down. And... But Lionel was a refugee. Got beaten up by the Zimbabwe security police, left for dead. Someone carried him over the border into Botswana where he was able to be taken to hospital. He still can't see very well in his one eye. Because of the damage, he's got a big scar on his head. And so Lionel was taken and, and he was fixed up in the hospital. And he was living as a refugee in Zim. And then, in, in Botswana, sorry. And then eventually got to the point where he realized he can't travel, he can't do anything, he wants to get his Zimbabwe passport. So he went back in and um, we were all praying. It happened a couple of years ago, also sort of during COVID. And um, managed to get his passport the moment he got his passport, Botswana said to him, now you've got a passport, you can't stay in the country, and they kicked him out. So Lionel now is trying to lead a, a church in Francistown in Botswana, but he can't be there for more than two weeks a month. So he's traveling backwards and forwards between the two places. And about, 
I don't know, six months ago, babe? Probably about six months ago, I think. It was when he was asked to leave and, and get out. And so Lionel's now sitting in, in Bulawayo, and he has to have, he has to organize a house, and what he was telling us this last week, I was at the Botswana um, training time. Uh, Botswana team time, sorry, we're planning next year and what God's doing to Botswana. So Lionel's sitting in this house and he told us the story that he, he woke up in the middle of the night and his kids are sleeping, his wife is sleeping, but the house they're staying in doesn't have any windows and doesn't have a door. And so the plastic is flapping on the windows and he looks at the door, and, and Lionel's a well-educated guy. This, this couple are like mint. mint. Mint, mint, amazing, amazing people. And Lionel's looking at the door, and there's a piece of corrugated iron, Ellie, eh, with, with like a, a drum, a steel drum, holding it in place. That's the door. And he's saying, God, why? I laid my life down, like literally I've laid my life down for you and for the church. Why? And he, I don't know if he moved the drum or whatever, but anyway, he was outside and he's looking at the building. And he felt God say to him, look again. So he's looking at the building and he still sees the plastic and the sheeting and the drum and everything like that. But he sees next door these beautiful houses and they've got security, go security you know, like um, burglar bars and windows and doors and all this stuff. He felt God say to him, those houses have all suffered break-ins. They've all... As people live in fear with all their stuff around it. But you've been here and no one's broken in. No one's come for you. I am your shield. I'm the one who protects you. And friends, that's, that's like a bit of a thing. Right? Look again. And then the most amazing thing, and I want to tell you the story because I want to say thank you to you guys as a community. Because you, you don't even know this. We don't share these stories. There's so many incredible stories that happen in this church. We told Pete and Lee that we would contribute some money, um, a decent chunk of money to them when they moved so that it would make them move easier from Bulawayo to, um, from Francis Town to Bulawayo, just to help them and love on them. And for some reason, we never got around to doing it. And that morning, I woke up and I said to Cindy, like, it's urgent. We have to do this today. So Lionel's won this battle now, right? No windows, no door. And he wakes up in the morning, wakes up in the morning, and then I message him. And it's like, hey, dude, what's your banking details? We need to sort this thing out. And within a couple of days, it paid for all the windows, all the doors, all the burglar bars. But you know, the most amazing thing is this. He's not relying on those things anymore to be his safety, right? God's, God was his safety no matter what. So now he lives under the safety of God, but also knows the provision of God, that God hears him. And friends, so many of us are fighting for that victory, the other side. But we've got to win the battle first. We're waiting for that testimony of God coming through, but we've got to win the battle first in faith, where we go to God about it, and we don't allow ourselves to be reduced. Anyway, I just wanted to say thank you, guys. You're so the guys who sow into the church and whatever, like, thank you. Your money makes a huge difference to people. Guys, honestly, it's amazing to see what God does. But, so I wanted to say that. But then, for us this morning, some of us are trusting God for moments like that. Maybe there's areas in your life you're looking and you see, hey, that window's not there and I wonder who's coming through and that door's not there or that situation's not right or I'm afraid of this. I feel like this morning, God wants to come and just settle Friends, we prayed at the pre-service prayer meeting. There is breakthrough on the horizon for so many of us. But it's the other side of winning this battle. And not running, but submitting to God. Can we bow our heads? Thank you so much for joining us. You might be asking yourself the question, how can I take this further? Firstly, you can send us your contact details to cindy at centerchurch.co.za where we can include you in our online connect groups and you can receive our daily devotional. Secondly, you can hop on our website where you can access previous sermons and find out more about who we are at Centre Church. Thirdly, if you consider yourself as part of Centre Church, we want to thank you so much for your ongoing financial partnership. The banking details are on the website. 
Thank you so much for joining us and hope you have an amazing Sunday.